Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you here on this session on the next generation DES technology, innovative DES and DCB stent platform that's sponsored by Concept Medical. Um, I'm here joined with our spokesperson, uh, Dr. Ale Alexandre Abezaid from Brazil. And with us, we have a fantastic panel, uh, Juan Iglesias, uh, uh, Rajneesh uh, Kapoor, uh, as well as Antonio Maggeri, just to my left, and Luca Testa. And here's uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Latib as well, who's here with us uh, from New York, Azim Latib. So it's a fantastic uh, symposium. We have these great cases. And you might say, Why, what, what's so interesting about DES anymore? Well, you're going to find out today because this uh, particular next generation DES technology uh, with a, a really innovative approach of delivering um, a good drug beyond the edges of the stent as well as the ability to treat some of the most complex and diffuse lesions with excellent results. And what we're going to do is, is think about this in calcific lesions, understanding the healing process uh, within this, as well as um, some of these uh, very, very interesting uh, cases that are coming from some of the experts from around the globe who will, who will be presenting to us. What I really encourage you is to ask whatever questions you may have. Every, uh, all of our colleagues will present their cases, uh, followed by a Q&A. We are not going to stop the case to uh, discuss the case during, because we want to stay right on time. So I ask our colleagues to finish their presentations within 10 minutes, so that we get about a 10-minute discussion time. And uh, my spokesperson here, uh, Dr. Abazide, is looking for your um, Q&A, for qu questions coming through. Um, uh, the, uh, the app, so please use the app and send in your questions and he'll be sure to raise the questions during the Q&A sessions. This really is a very interactive session and we want to make it really fun. So without further ado, I'm going to, um, it's my pleasure to, to introduce Antonio Maggeri who's going to talk to us about abluminous DES uh, stent in calcific lesions. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the kind invitation and uh, for the kind introduction. So it's my pleasure to uh, discuss and show you some cases that we have performed with this uh, new platform, the Abluminous Death Plus uh, uh, stand uh, in the setting of calcified lesion. These are my conflicts of interest. So why uh, Abluminous Death Plus seems to be, uh, to my opinion, a good stand with a good performance in calcified lesion? Because essentially we have a good cell design, you see that uh, with the increase of the diameter of the stand, we have a, an higher number of cell design, which assure essentially a very low recoil in the treatment of calcified lesion. We have a strut thickness of uh, 73 microns, which is preserved among a broad spectrum of uh, uh, dimension of the stand. We have a very short foreshortening. You see here that it is uh, less than 1%, and especially we have a good trackability. So sometimes when you have to deliver the stand inside of calcified lesion, you don't use uh, and you don't need essentially the uh, guide extension catheters. Uh, we had the opportunity to join this important study, the Ability Diabetes Global, which uh, aims to compare the performance of the albuminous stent versus science in more than uh, 3,000 patients uh, with, uh, I would say, very uh, wide uh, inclusion criteria so that we had the possibility to treat uh, very old commerce patients uh, and we have very few um, limitations to the uh, randomization of the patient. I will start with uh, this case. Uh, he's a 72 years old. Uh, he had, uh, for sure, uh, type 2 diabetes. He has some symptoms of angina, CCS2. Mild dyspnea, you see that the rest stress perfusion imaging was pos positive for an anterior ischemia. Here you can appreciate two angiographic view. The first one is the caudal view, and you see there is uh, some disease around the marginal branch, but uh, with, uh, with a very limited uh, extension in the territory of this 
distribution and you see that the most important uh, uh, tight lesion is around uh, the proximal part of the LED. You can see also how calcified is that lesion. The calcification extends from the proximal part of the vessel up to the mid portion. And you see that there are also some calcification around the diagonal branches. So I think this is a not so complex case, but uh, uh, it can be challenging. I think that uh, also a bit of discussion could be uh, around the type of lesion preparation that we can uh, give to this patient to obtain a, a good result. So I, I will show directly what I have done, and so maybe we can discuss later on about the outcome of the patient. So we predilate gently in just in order to have a baseline evaluation at the IVO. So you see that the proximal part of the LAD is huge and uh, essentially uh, free from the significant disease. And when we approach the tightest part, you see that some uh, concentric calcification are coming. This seems to be a very deep calcification because we don't see a lot of reverberation. And when we move uh, distal, you see that the calcium becomes a little bit less organized. Then we have some Icelanders. Um, but not uh, concentric and uh, 360 degrees uh, um, calcium. So the extension of the calcification was not so huge. And uh, my approach in this case was uh, essentially to do that. Uh, so I predilated gently the first diagonal just to, in order to avoid uh, an abrupt closure after the predilation of the main vessel. And uh, I went with a non-compliant balloon 3.0 up to 24 atmospheres. But you see that uh, uh, there is still a neck. I don't uh, like, the, like the, the behavior of the balloon because we still see a minus around uh, the diagonal. We repeated, we just uh, did a small puff of contrast just to verify that there was no damage of the vessel itself. And you see that uh, I was run, the intermediate I was run, showed some uh, uh, cutting of the calcium, especially in the proximal portion. But you see that uh, in some other areas, uh, the calcium is uh, still uh, not cracked and not well prepared. So um, essentially you see that here the calcification seems to be a little bit eccentric. There's a problem of uh, costs. Uh, and uh, so what I decided to do was not to go for a shockwave, but to use the cutting balloon at the same diameter inflated at high pressure. So essentially my uh, philosophy in this uh, setting is to perform a, a small downsizing of the cutting balloon compared to the media to media diameter and to go up very high pressure. Here I inflated the cutting balloon at 26 atmospheres and you see that the IVUS run after all was uh, even better. You see that some cracks are, um, can be observed in different points of the IVUS run. So I was quite satisfactory about uh, the behavior of the balloon. You see that the uh, uh, inflation of the balloon is more symmetrical. And so I proceeded in planting the abluminous desk. You see here that I did not utilize the guide extension because the trackability of the scent is quite nice. The diagonal had a, a small uh, uh, plug shift around the ostium, but it was patent with a timid reflow. And I decided to leave uh, the result like this because I was uh, completely satisfied. Um, post dilation with a pot at 4.0, 20 atmospheres. I did uh, like a um, um, distal DCB just in order to maintain a more homogeneous uh, distal landing zone of the of the stand. And you see the final result also at the IVUS, which looks uh, pretty nice. We have just uh, this uh, part, which is a little bit uh, asymmetrical in terms of stand expansion. But I think that in this case, the performance of the stand and also the PCI was OK. We have another case, a 79 years old male, very complex uh, uh, clinical history, essentially based on the advanced chronic kidney failure. He has a baseline um, creatinine of 2.2 and uh, also a low ejection fraction due to uh, essentially anteroceptal hypokinesia and some uh, previous uh, um, ischemic history in the territory of the RCA. He had uh, an angiography uh, in another hospital with no indication to revascularization because the, co the case was too complex. But unfortunately, the patient was readmitted in our institution for uh, uh, acute heart failure, decompensation. You see that the vital parameter was very bad, and also the blood chemistry was not so reassuring. So uh, we did, and we repeated the echo, the FDA was uh, 
35% we have confirmed anterior wall and apical akinesia. So discussed the, uh, the case in a heart team, we decided to revascularize the LAD and the CERC, but with Impella CP support. RCA had no in indication for intervention because uh, evidence of necrosis. So we set up uh, a single access procedure from the left femoral. Essentially, we punctured the introducer of the Impella. We mm, placed a seven French EBU guiding catheter. We gave a strong endotomotic therapy, but we have to remember that the patient had an advanced chronic injury, and so we planned to do an IVUS essentially based PCI with minimal contrast and calcium modification technique. Here you see two shots. You can appreciate the severe disease, especially the distal part of the left main involving almost all the segments of all the coronaries. And uh, we started with a rotablation of the LED. You see that we started with a bar, 1.5 bar, which was able to cross the tightest part in the mid part of the uh, LED. You see that the IVUS following the 1.5 and the non-compliant balloon preparation, you see that still there are some signs of preparation by the rota bar, but still we have a not good and satisfactory result. That's why we decided to upgrade at rotablator 1.75 bar, and then we post-dilated using a very high pressure non-compliant balloon 3.0. You see here that the other IVUS runs showed some cracks around the calcium and now we were satisfied that we implanted two stent. We did a DCB on the circ. We performed the pot protruding on the left main and finally you see the results uh, which was quite satisfactory. If you see at the um, uh, IVUS imaging the stent expansion seems to be very symmetrical. Like, again we had not major concerns about you know the trackability of the stent and the possibility also to do a generous spot uh, with the, uh, thanks to the cell designs of the abluminous death. Um, you see that on the circ we have a preserved flow after the DCB and even if the result seems to be not so good we had a, a preserved uh, flow on the circ itself and so we were happy about the results. Six months follow-up for the trial was quite positive unfortunately the patient went on dialysis but no miss were, uh, were observed. So um, abluminous death plus technology can help, I think, in the treatment of also severely calcified lesion thanks to the appealing technical features that I have uh, described in presence of good lesion preparation. I think that also the trackability is important. Uh, we sometimes don't need the guide extension catheter to cross this lesion and to advance uh, the bluminous uh, in this uh, particularly challenging settings. I think that also in the future, some sub-analysis of the ability global study could help to better elucidate the performance of the abilities that's plus in calcified lesion. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Antonio. Let's, why don't you stay there because you might need to work those again. Um, so let's open this up for, for Q&A. Um, uh, but before we go to the audience, are there any uh, Azim? Uh, what, what about um, the second case, uh, Impella guided? Uh, well, why would you, would you choose, uh, is there a, 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 a preference of a stent at this point in time, one versus the other for you? And what, what did you think about the, uh, the technique and how Antonio went on to, to, uh, to do this case? Yeah. Thanks, Roussan. I think Antonio you did a great job. I think these kind of patients with low ejection fractions, multivalve disease, and chronic kidney disease are amongst the highest risk patients we see. And so planning the procedure is extremely important. Um, when we do these cases, um, we do it very similar. Maybe one of the diff things different we, we would have done in my lab is we would have started with a right heart cath. We use a lot of hemodynamics to try and understand how these patients are going to do, how much support they need. But I think in someone with low flow, low grade in AS, I worry about rotor and how well they're going to tolerate rotor. So having the impeller support is great. It's a good idea. Uh, I also like the fact that you used imaging. 
you know, rotor up front, make your life easy. I mean, the worst thing is kind of having to switch later to rotor or having rotor regret when you can't pass your stents. So I think if you think it's diffusely disease, start with rotor up front. I think that's pretty important too. And then make sure you have IVA's guidance. The one thing you didn't mention, I would have loved to know is how much contrast you use for this case. Because we... Yeah. I, I think there were two shots of uh, three C four shots of the three CC, I think 12. Right, I mean, because we, we, we're dye. pretty aggressive in these patients, like as we're doing them, I'm giving them lots of fluids, like at least running at about 250 cc's an hour. And what I do is I look at the GFR and I'll give, I'll give them the amount of contrast is GFR times one for me in a patient like this. So if the GFR was 24 or 20, I'd stay try and stay underneath that. I think you had nice septal branches and so on that could help you as far as stenting without contrast. I think that's important because it's no point in these sick patients, we get good revascularization and then they succumb because of other problems. But I think so, it was a good case. So we don't have the abluminous stents available in, 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 a, in where, where you and I work, but these guys do. Would you choose this particular stent, anyone, or do you have no reason to choose this particular stent? And then maybe, Antonio, you could comment on that. Dr. Kumar? Yeah, so I think abluminous uh, is, is a great uh, stent platform and uh, in complex lesions, more calcified vessels, the strut thickness is also 80, 80 microns, so uh, conformability of the stent is very good, uh, radial strength is very good. And then uh, specifically advantage is that the edge restenosis, there is some uh, drug eluted to the balloons, you know, 0.5 millimeter on both sides, uh, balloon also has a drug. So that also uh, is a big advantage that uh, the long lasting results would be there with this stand. So, so all other things uh, are, in, uh, uh, are positive about this stand and specifically the, the outcomes, you know, long lasting outcomes are very good with this stand. So I think no reason, I mean, first choice with, with us in all complex legions is abluminous. Alex, are there questions from yes. the audience? Could you yes, tell us? Yes, there is. Uh, I don't know if you can hear yeah. me. Yes. So uh, there is actually one question that I, I would have uh, the same thoughts here, Antonio. For your first tell case. Tell from. Yeah. Who's uh, the question from? Dr. <laughs> Sophia de Graui. Thank you. Dr. Sophie. de Graui. Thank you, Sophia. Okay. So, uh, so her question is about a hybrid approach for the first patient yeah. that you had a bifurcation. So together with Abluminus to put another DCB at the side branch, yeah, at the diagonal. The and if uh, this is any of uh, concern in terms of uh, tripling the dose, right? Because you have Abluminus, yeah. you have uh, DCB, the main branch, plus another DCB. So it's, uh, it's a little bit more drug to be but, delivered. But but that's sure. <laughs> no, wait a minute, though. <laughs> I like that, though. <laughs> Let's make sure that we're not calling the, uh, the, the Abluminus stent a double dose stent. Done. The, the, it is not a stent and a DCB. It's not a drug-coated stent and a DCB. What it is is that the, it's, the stent is crimped on the balloon and then the drug is applied. So there, it's not like you're getting twice the dose, but rather a homogeneous distribution that is not just on the struts but also on the balloon. I think it's really important to, to yes, make sure yeah. we distinguish that from a double dosing of, of, of abluminous because this and, keeps and even, coming even up and people did, aren't understanding The amount that. of drug right, that mm. uh, gets uh, to the vessel wall, it's a percentage of what it's you load. It's a little bit more, yeah. but so it's, it's not. So it's good to have more. So, so Roxana, can you clarify that again? Because I think that's like the most important thing about yes, the stand. Yes, and I'll discuss right? that again. But is, it, I mean, is it just on the, on the edges of the balloon where no. there's drug, or is it also in the gap? It's in the gaps as, as well. well. So okay. think about that. Mostly it's a homogeneous gaps. delivery. Usually the stents are on a on a large plate that then they coat and yep. then they're put on the right. on the balloon. Here, the stent is crimped on the balloon and then given uh, the the full. Um, you know, no. uh, so, so the drug stent, on, stent, stent, the uh, drug is eluted on the abluminal surface of yeah, the stent. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. It's after given, it is crimped and yeah. then. The additional 0.5 millimeter edges beyond the stent are also on. drug eluted. Right. right. So balloon is also drug eluted to some extent beyond the stent, but stent is abluminally coated once. It is not a double dose. Yeah. Everyone yeah. needs Absolutely. to understand not that because dose. this is yeah. the part that gets everyone. 
But know. but now if you put another DCB in the side yes, branch and come to the main question. branch, then I'm you're going to have a little bit more right. in the main branch, which yeah. I don't believe it's a problem, but I want to hear your opinion. I don't think it's a big problem. So in this case, just I want to underline that the DCB was done in the distal part, uh, just because for a technical problem, I think uh, you have to make your life easier in the cat lab. I predilated, I created a bit of a dissection around the ostium of the diagonal. Sometimes when you have to rewire to do a DCB, the risk is that uh, you have a, a worse flow and so I prefer just to do the DCB distal because at the IVUS evaluation there was a lot and so much disease and so I wanted like to have a better result. But it, it is an interesting thing this idea of application of DCB now that if it becomes available then you just like <laughs> let's pull it up and let's just treat just everything <laughs> while we're at it. You but become I'm, like I'm a painter. So <laughs> I'm not so sure that that's the best thing but, but it's great. Any other questions? Because yeah. we need to so, move on. So, so in, in your case number one I have just one uh, question which is coming to my mind. You you inflated a cutting balloon at 26 atmospheres. Yeah. RBP of uh, cutting balloons are usually less. <laughs> yeah. So that came to my mind. There is always a threat that we may rupture the cutting balloons at these pressures. So do you, it's a practice? Do you routinely it, do it? It's a problem with Antonio's because Antonio Colombo oh, always... Antonio uh, Colombo is a big <laughs> supporter of this. Uh, it's a maniac of high pressure cutting. So basically we have done a randomized trial. Okay. It has been published so we have supported we by data. So it's... Um, Okay. It's quite safe, you I can be say. More yeah. okay. Antonio, thank you for thank you. sharing thank you. this wonderful cases. And um, Luca Testa probably has a huge experience with Abluminus. He's going to tell us about lesion preparation yeah. to healing process. Thank you, Roxana. Yes. So I have to say that there is a consistency between the case just shown by Antonio and the case I'm about to show you. And the, the title says a lot, I have to say. So let's start from some clinical history. Talking about an 80, 84 years old gentleman with some comorbidities, as you can see, and risk factors, of, of course, including type 2 diabetes. It has been referred to our center for worsening dyspnea and angina in a known uh, severe aortic stenosis at this time. So the echo obviously confirmed what we knew about the, the aortic valve with a mean gradient high, much higher than 40. And then the aortic valve area, well, definitely in favor of this diagnosis of aortic stenosis and the MIDMR. So we, oh, we always, always use the CT scan in order to you know, make a plan in terms of tower procedures. So we discovered, and was actually an unexpected finding, a critical LED stenosis. Just to briefly, very briefly showing that this is the procedure we've done in, uh, in this patient with Acro Neo 2. We use also a um, protection device, in term, a cerebral protection device in this case that was included in, in another trial. But obviously, after this procedure, and I just want to make sure and to answer this question I'm putting myself, I mean, we aligned the valve in order to, you know, make our life easier. And actually, in keeping with Antonio said before, we need to make our life easier. So we aligned the valve in order not to have any problem in terms of access. So as you can see, there is a lot of calcium in the proximal LAD. And uh, just let it run because I want you to appreciate how tight is this, let's say, proximal segment of the LAD. Where also, there is a diagonal over there, so similar anatomy. So it was complicated to, to wire, and uh, we needed to use some, let's say, CTO techniques. Not pretty much, I have to say, but definitely we needed to use a micro cutter fine cross, and also we used the Fidel XTA. So we started with unsuccessful dilatation of 1.25 millimeter balloon. I have to say that my threshold to use some aggressive lesion preparation when the calcification is huge is really low. So we immediately switched to rotational aterectomy in order to create some space. And I have to say, with a burr 1 to 5 a one, and burr 1.5, at that time, you may argue, well, you should have a better look, as Antonio did before with IVUS, maybe OCT, whatever. So, but in that case, I felt that was probably not the right time, because lesion preparation is something that you need to take seriously. And then... A predilatation after the rotor wire or rotor bl ablator with balloon 25 that was delivered through the guide cutter extension because the support in this case was absolutely suboptimal. And then through the cutter, guiding cutter extension, the abluminous 3, 32 millimeters. And I have to say that in this case, after relieving the aortic stenosis, there was no problem in keeping this device inflated for 30 seconds. This is an information we didn't say before, but this is absolutely important. In order to maximize the drug illusion in a very homogeneous way, we need to keep the balloon inflated for at least 
30 seconds, better would be 40 seconds. And sometimes you may have some hemodynamic compromise in, in the patient, in particular, if you have this kind of situation with your valve. So we started, treated the aortic stenosis, and then we decided to, to do the PCI. So again, we put a, with a standard three by 32 millimeters, and then post dilatation, aggressive post dilatation with 3.5. And when I say aggressive, I mean that there's no post dilatation below than 24 milli atmospheres, so there's nothing. So 3, 5, 26, 24 atmospheres, and that was the final angel that you can see better in this view. So at that time, we decided to, to have a better look, and so we did. So I will let it run. As you can immediately appreciate, there is a, some kind of dissection at the distal edge, but the rest of the, of the stent is nicely rounded. There is no mala position. Uh, obviously, I, I will let it go. Obviously, the calcium is still there because when you do the preparation, even aggressively, you are not honestly actually deleting the calcium 100% of this. But we wanted to make sure there was no, nothing left behind in terms of the major dissection. There was a minimal dissection at the edge, but we decided not to touch that dissection. The point is that this dissection I'm showing you, again, in the left side of the slide, has healed at nine months because we called back this patient to see what was the biological interaction of this device with the arterial wall. And as you can see on the right side, I left the left side just as a comparison, that dissection has healed over time. So in other words, it was really reassuring. Again, I'm talking about very high risk patient, very old, diabetic. So all the things that you may anticipate that are going to increase the risk of problems in terms of stenosis, and thrombosis and bad healing didn't happen. So ultimately, we made all this, I would say, efforts in order to make sure that this biological interaction of the device was absolutely optimal. Oh, I will let it go, it's too fast, I don't know why, but anyway, there, there's no problem. You can see it in the longitudinal reconstruction, but also you can see, well, not very clearly, I have to say, in the OCT cross section, the dissection we left as yield. So my conclusions are simple, I have to say, because the acute performance of the abluminous was reassuring. Even a complex lesion with high calcific burden provided necessary lesion preparation. It makes a lot of sense to prepare carefully, in particular in the presence of calcium, because obviously, if you want to really deliver in an homogeneous way your drug, you need to prepare the lesion. You, make, you need to create crux. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. At the follow-up, the biological interaction between the abluminous and the coronary wall in a diabetic patient seemed encouraging as we observed full strut coverage, minimal hyperplasia, and a smooth healing process of the observed edge dissection. Thank you very much. I saved some time for... That's perfect. That's a, there's a lot of good discussion yeah. here, and I think it kind of builds upon what we want to talk about. Uh, I want to ask uh, Juan, any comments on this, and what do you think about the, the healing of the dissection? Do you, do you actually believe that the dissection healed because of the abluminous device? Congratulations, Luca. Very nice case. Uh, I mean, I have two comments here. Um, the first one is we were discussing about the choice of stent in calcify lesion. I think that you made the point in your discussion. I mean, the stent is just one part of the problem. Lesion preparation is key, and you nicely demonstrate in your case, Antonio, too, that you have to spend time in preparing correctly these highly complex lesions, and you will get a good result. You have a good stent with nice properties in terms of uh, radial strength, in visibility as well, in side branch access in case you have a side branch as well, but the preparation is key, and uh, imaging as well. I mean, the, the most complex of these patients are the most you will get from imaging. And second, look, going back to, uh, to dissections, I mean, um, uh, I think we are now at the time where you are, we are seeing more and more and more of these, these dissections because we have intraconal imaging and we use DCBs. In this case, your stent is landing, as far as I can see, in a fibrous tissue. So I think that it's a pretty thick uh, fibrous cap. So I think I was quite confident in letting this heal by itself. But uh, coming to the point of what kind of dissection we should leave behind, I feel more and more comfortable with this kind of devices having elution outside of the stent in uh, leaving all this that small dissection, just interesting, the uh, the intima in a thick fibrous tissue alone. And uh, as mentioned, we, we did some 
re-injured of these patients and all these lesions ill by itself. I mean, and this is also the case in DCB uh, cases where we just leave this dissection as far as we don't get a deep, uh, a deep engagement in the media. So again, I think it's just having the good device in hands, but as always to make uh, use of all the properties of the device. And uh, I'm sure that actually having some, some drug, Cyrolimus outside of the stent may happen in these cases and will simplify because what we want at the end is avoiding long stent segments and avoid as far as we can overlapping stents. And this technology can help to reduce that. And coming back to, to this point and uh, looking at uh, the cases from Antonio, I think that one of the important points here is having the same drug and the same, um, let's say, concept on the balloon, the magic touch, and these devices, and it makes things a lot easier. You have the full, st the full treated segment treated with the same drug as far as we can get a good lesion preparation first. Yeah, well, I, I have to say that, you know, this is really, this is really the point. I mean, the, the device obviously has some features, technical features, and some ideas that might be absolutely interesting in terms of, you know, dealing, tackling these complex situations with a, a reasonable, in a reasonable way. Nevertheless, it's up to us to make it better in terms of preparation. We, I, I'm positively convinced that without preparation, there's no device that can do the job. So in particular, in these settings, I mean, it's up to us to prepare the field for this kind of devices. Otherwise, they are not going to work. No, it's a, it's a really good point. Azim? Yeah, I, had a I had a question, a comment. So Luca made an interesting comment earlier that you need to leave the balloon inflated for about 40 seconds because you also want to make sure you're looting the drug right. on the edges. Yep. And it's just important for the audience to understand that's not a deficiency of this device. <laughs> you right. know, you should that's probably right. be leaving your stents when you inflate a stent. I see a lot of fast food PCI, oh. and I call it. People go up and then they go negative with a stent. And that's not the good way to implant stents. If we really want to implant stents well and make sure that your stents are well expanded, there's really good data to take your time to go up slower leave it up for 20, 30 seconds, and it's going to be fine. You're going to get better stent expansion. And I guess those of us who've used drug-coated balloons feel now more comfortable doing that. I think this, what you said, it's not a deficiency of this device. It actually makes you be a better interventionist by staying up a little bit longer. Yeah. I did have one question, though. Um, do we, when we look at all the different drug eluding stents we see, we do see differences in outcomes for calcified lesions because calcified lesions are more complex. Do we have data for bluminous in calcified lesions? Oh, not, not yet. Not yet. I mean, no. No, I mean, uh, obviously we are focusing on several aspects, in particular in diabetes, and Roxana will tell us a lot about it. But definitely, there is, as far as I know at least, there is no specific trial on calcified lesions, but definitely we will look at this in all the amount, a huge amount of literature and data we are collecting. Well, obviously, oh, I'm not convinced, I'm not 100% convinced that this device will be the right one for calcifications. Obviously, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that well, going back to the technology behind, it might be it might be a good solution because of this homogeneous distribution of the drug, mm -hmm. provided, you know, a careful preparation. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And then, obviously, we can use image. We can use all the devices that we have in order to improve our knowledge in terms of details and, of course, to guide our intervention. And as you said before, take your time. No rush. And then I would say that these two cases, well, these three cases presented by Antonio and me are actually going in the same direction. Take your time. Put yourself in a comfortable position. You'll, you know, assist device, the LD assist device, treat the artist stenosis before. So you're not going to have any problem when your balloon is inflated for 40 seconds. I mean, if you look backwards, inflating a balloon approximately LED for 40 seconds without the LV, let's say, device, or after treating the aortic stenosis, it would be a problem. So we need to go back to basics, put ourselves in a good position to optimize what we are doing. Great. Alex, are there questions? Yes. So, so two quick questions. One, um, Roxanne, I think that we make the audience a little bit uh, in doubt on, on, about the coating. So I'm sure that you're going to clarify during your presentation, but very quickly. 
the coating and the spray is after crimping. So not only the abluminal part of the stent will be coated, right. but also the gaps exactly. where the, the balloon is, and together with the half millimeter overhanging in each proximal and distal side. So that's an, a, an advantage potentially to protect the edges as well. But I'm sure that you have beautiful slides about that. That's to, for my no, friend actually, Ariel. Rogering? <laughs> well, actually, I if I can I just, uh, if I can add uh, just a little, uh, I'm not uh, that. a figure. I mean, you don't I'm need to imagine that the stand is a cylinder. The stand is a net. So inside this, let's say, frame, you got space. This space is actually occupied by the balloon. Mm -hmm. So if you crimp the and there. then you spray whatever, you sp you put the drug. Let's say this drug would be on the surface of the stand and in the gaps. Mm -hmm. And what you got in the, these gaps? The balloon. So it's not a drug coated exactly. balloon plus the DES. It's it. a drug coated, drug eluting stent. And in the exposed parts of the balloon, you will have drug as well. Yeah. Together with an extra film that protects yeah. when it gets to the coronary and transfer to the vessel wall. Wonderful. So another quick question about uh, do antiplatelet therapy. Oh. Uh, in your case, particularly, oh. three months is okay, or you would go oh. further? The next question, please. No, that's, <laughs> no the, okay. that's the last one I have. All right. Uh, From an anonymous person. Oh, yeah, that's, it. that's why. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, we got guidelines uh, suggesting what is the appropriate duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. So we say that for stable patients, it's going to be six months. If it's HBR patient, you need to consider all, all this risk and thrombotic and, ble and bleeding. So in this specific case, considering the age, considering what it was, I mean, the clinical situation, we basically went for one month. And up, I would say after a year, nothing has happened. So it was safe. But this is not a recommendation. I'm just saying we follow the guidelines and still we don't have a specific guidelines on this specific DES. Right. I think it's really important. We do not have the different durations of dual antiplatelet therapies tested with this particular platform. And I think that's what you're telling us. And I think you need to use your judgment and, uh, of course, evaluating the patient's bleeding and ischemic risk and, and, and choose accordingly. One last short question and then we go to the just, next. Just maybe a, another final comment for the audience. You know, this patient had severe aortic stenosis and a very tight LAD lesion, right? And you treated the valve first and then the LAD. But it's important for the audience to know it's not because you wanted to inflate a balloon for 45 seconds. I think more and more we will treat the valve first and do the coronary afterwards because it makes the coronary lower risk. Absolutely true. Thank you. Although the subject of whether you need to treat the coronary <laughs> is part of a Another large <laughs> clinical trial called COMPLETE yes, that is ongoing exactly. at That's the moment. That's a good propaganda. So I think it's but important here. to understand <laughs> that. Thank you so much. Can I, can I add one point to this? So, so this is important uh, suggestion coming from Azim, but uh, once you're doing so, I think you need to look at the valve also so that the coronary access is smoother after that. So uh, the valve selection, if you are suspecting or you have documented important. a coronary lesion, uh, should be according to that. Excellent. All right. Dr. Kapoor, Raj Kapoor is going to talk to us some more uh, case presentations of his experience with this stent well, thank and you. platform. Thank you for getting me here. It's really a privilege. Uh, so I can just uh, put it like this, that for the last two years, uh, this has been a stent of my choice practically for all complex lesions and uh, uh, since uh, we have a huge diabetic population in India, uh, we get many complex lesions and uh, uh, as per, uh, you know, if we take into the registry data, I think our results have been really good over the time. So uh, in continuing the same thing as there was a lot of talk that how this stent looks like, so this is how this is how, how this is slide which everybody was wanting. Mm -hmm. So it's an albuminally coated stent and uh, which facilitates a monodirectional drug release leading to faster re-endothelization. So this is a very big advantage it seems. This is not a circumferentially coated and this is coated after being crimped. So coating on the stent as well as the exposed parts of a balloon make it uh, innovative uh, device, which is drug eluting stent and a drug coated balloon as well. So this also facilitates a homogeneous drug delivery to the entire lesion, which addresses the issue of any geographical miss and diffuse proliferative disease in diabetic patients. 
patients <clears throat> so this is the edge you know 0.5 millimeter coating beyond the proximal and distal edges of the stent and it addresses the issue of edge restenosis which day in and day out we look we uh, encounter in our patients uh, the the restenosis happening at the edges so biodegradable film as it was coming from dr alexander also so so this is uh, kind of giving a homogeneous distribution into the endothelium uh, 73 micron less than 80 so very conformable stent and a cobalt chromium uh, stent uh, platform with a serolimus eluting stent so uh, abluminal coating is less than 5 microns so it looks very great uh, very ideal in terms of the stent technology and this is the slide which i think just put emphasis on the fact that current drug eluting uh, stent technical specifications versus abluminal so in current all deaths the crimping is done after coating which may affect you know some kind of elution or uh, you know uh, do some kind of issues but in abluminous the uniform coating layer is achieved as stent is prior mounted on a balloon uh, dual side coating in the current deaths versus abluminal coating and uh, you know obviously i have given that advantages could be the edge restenosis is mitigated and it's a very homogeneous delivery so having said that uh, i'm showing you two cases which are uh, which i have done few months back so this is a case number 1 and a first stage of this case 74 year old male patient diabetic hypertensive uh, ef is good and patient had a uh, unstable angina and with ecg changes and uh, angiography i'm going to show it was a critical triple vessel very complex so patient was considered for cbg also but he had a severe chest deformity kyphoscoliosis which makes him totally unfit candidate for cbg and heart team approach we have taken this decision that he's not fit for cbg so this is the coronary angiogram uh, very long diffuse LED disease calcified obviously not straight away looking a case of a pci and then a dominant circ uh, and if you if you see down there is a bifurcation lesion in the circ also obtuse marginal and the the main circ so this is the angiogram very diffuse critical disease and then uh, since there is no option of cbg uh, we proceeded with uh, the PCI so pre dilated the LED aggressively with 2.5 millimeter balloon still was getting a lot of resistance while trying to advance the stent it was uh, as clearly mentioned abluminous all the way uh, so I had to use a guiding extension catheter put it into the LED and with uh, still a difficulty I could manage to get the uh, abluminous down so this is 2.7540 this is another advantage it comes in all lengths you know the variable lengths are there and then uh, another stent overlapped approximately uh, but there was a huge diagonal also so decided to do the mini crush here bifurcation stenting uh, one in diagonal 2.512 and 2.7532 into the uh, proximal LED overlapped with the previous uh, stent. Look at the ECG, it shows huge STT changes. This was a very important LED for the patient and while doing that, uh, patient was highly restless, complaining of severe chest pain and uh, uh, so, so with that, you know, I could stent the LED two stents and bifurcation stenting with the LED proximal diagonal. It looks good, the flow is good. Uh, there is some issue, I mean, I was skeptical about the ostium of the LED, uh, but angiographically it looked good, so I did the OCT. This is the OCT picture. And this is once coming uh, LED from distally backwards. A small dissection, but I think not very significant at the distal edge. This is a stent, bit erratic, highly calcified and while coming back i was more interested in knowing the ostium and the circ ostium so i'll run this it's a little bit fast but we can decipher the circ ostium which looked okay to me in this oct picture yeah so this, this is the one and left main is fine so at this point although uh, it was on the anvil that i go ahead and do the circ bifurcation also but patient was highly in uh, discomfort and not cooperating at all so i stopped the procedure here and then 
I thought uh, now we are still left with that CERC and, uh, CERC and OM bifurcation, but then let's see how it goes. Uh, patient uh, was uneventful next few days, was discharged, but then patient came back to the outdoor uh, complaining of uh, angina on minimal effort and uh, I escalated the anti-anginals but still patient complained the same symptoms for three or four weeks despite all aggressive therapy and this is how uh, it looked after that. So the circ ostium was not looking good. So the stent was there up till the LED ostium. It pinched a circ ostium little bit. I didn't do the circ osteal OCT in the first go although it was a OCT from the LED ostium stent and from that indirectly it looked like that it was relatively better so I stopped there but uh, once patient complained of that so now uh, there are two lesions to handle one is the circ ostium and uh, and then the bifurcation lesion down in the circumflex so 7 French EBU catheter and the, the bifurcation stenting done at the circumflex uh, and OM again a mini crush uh, 2 abluminous 3 into 16 into the circ and 2.75 12 into the OM after having done that uh, came to a left main to circ crossover stenting crushing some part of uh, not crushing just touching a butting because I knew from the previous OCT it was not protruding into the left main it was just coming at the ostium covering the full ostium so this is uh, a 4 into 16 uh, from left main to circ and then a uh, kissing balloon uh, 3.5 into the LED and 4 uh, into left main into circ. So properly kissing was done and this is uh, the OCT from now circ back into the left main. There was dissection at the distal uh, circ stent. So fix that with a smaller stand, but this time it looked all fine. The coverage opposition in the left main was okay. Since there was some dissection, edge dissection in the circ stand, so another 4 into 12 abluminous deployed there. This is the final result. So uh, that's what I'm saying. Some challenging cases, uh, you know, calcified vessels uh, like to use this stand because pretty comfortable uh, with almost uh, very big volumes around two years. This is another case, 65 year old male patient, diabetic, hypertensive, almost 70-80% of our PCIs are diabetic population. Uh, he had a post bypass uh, in 2005. Uh, another uh, PTCA to RCA, uh, two stents in RCA was done in 2022 or somewhere outside, then he came with a severe unstable angina or severe effort angina. So angiographically, it was diffusely disease native RCA patent lima and blocked SVG to circ. So main uh, culprit vessel of causing angina was this uh, because circ was also uh, supplied from RCA and it's a diffuse RCA disease. Calcified ISR and the PD ostium, very diffuse disease. So entire disease length of RCA and ISR lesion was predilated 2.5 millimeter balloon there was a very tight in, uh, instant restortic lesion at this point. So I used the cutting balloon at uh, 3 into 12, 12 atmospheres and proximal uh, throughout the length of the stent was again dilated with the cutting balloon. So then still there was a waste here. It was not going, I used an OPN balloon 3 into 10 at 40 atmospheres and then the distal RC lesion was stented. There was a lesion beyond that previous stent and the PD osteal. So there were two stents used and having done a very aggressive cutting balloon and a high pressure balloon inside the ISR. So then I picked the magic touch uh, drug eluting balloon. Uh, it's a 35 uh, millimeter long magic touch balloon and dilated for more than a minute, kept it there and this is the final result. So very diffuse RCA. I don't have a OCT image, although I did the OCT after this. So this is how it looked after that. So uh, trying to say that in all these complex challenging cases, so my take home message is in the era of diffuse disease, complex PCI, such innovative stent technologies, 
like Ablumina seems to be very fitting option for patients with such complex coronary lesions. However, the adjunct usage of cutting balloon, ultra high pressure balloon, drug coating balloon seems to be a very good answer to achieve the best outcomes in these complex subsets. Thank you. Thank you so much. Luca um, and uh, Antonio, well, let's start with Luca. Um, you have a lot of experience. What did you think of those cases? I thought maybe in that last case, the very first uh, case that came back with the ostium of the circ, that it looked like the ostium of the LAD now looked a little bit pinched. So yeah. you'll tell us about that. But what did you think about? I mean, there was a lot of, uh, lots of use of, uh, in this diabetic patient population, with, uh, you know, this, this is a, these are tough patients. What yeah. did you think about that? Well, uh, these are basically one of those cases that you, you know, you can consider probably the worst case where you put some stents and then you know that somehow they may fail because obviously the disease was definitely diffuse. And I honestly understand why initially he tried to minimize the number of stents, yeah. but it didn't work. So after um, how many, few weeks, maybe, you did One the second month. procedure? Four, four weeks. Four weeks, okay. I mean, I have to say that, you know, when I've seen the, the angel after a few weeks, I said, well, this is definitely the problem of this kind of patients because they have aggressive, aggressive evolution. I will not say risk stenosis in this case, but definitely this is something that we see every day. And uh, the question is, is it the stent the right answer for this patient? Well, sometimes it's the only way, it's the only approach, the only solution that you got. But definitely, this is not enough. And uh, but I have, I have to say that for some of the techniques, some of the things done, I probably try to minimize even further the use of stent. I mean, less metal in this case probably is the right way to go. But this is postdoc. No, no, it's, it's interesting. Uh, Antonio, yeah, any just, comments on that case? No, but just one question for uh, everyone in the panel, maybe also in the audience. Why uh, you think there was a so aggressive uh, progression of disease at the ostium of the circuit? You think that uh, landing at the ostium of the LAD, you change uh, the, the geometry of the distal bifurcation? And, uh, so what is your recommendation at the end? Uh, maybe uh, landing inside of the distal left main would have been uh, a better choice? Well, I can say what, what I would typically do is in this case, even if, you know, you got some space in between the osteal LAD and left main, I tend to cover the left main immediately. But I'm not saying that this is the way to go. What I'm saying is this kind of patient when you can anticipate an aggressive reaction to, to the metal, I would probably go for it. In particular because, but this, again, this is post-hoc, I mean, you may have saved the stent left main LCX if you just... But just an hypothesis, if you put a stent in the first place, left main LAD. We don't, we don't have the proof, of course, but this is just an idea. Yeah, I think uh, this is the way one can think uh, later on. But that point, you know, uh, my uh, clear thinking was uh, same. That, uh, you know, if we can get away with uh, osteal stent, uh, you know, into the LAD and covering the length of disease in the LAD, because that was very critical. And then patient may do well. And we, I checked it with all the OCT and everything. But I think it was a carinal shift because angle was not very good. And uh, uh, although I thought that, you know, patient may be doing better with all the anti-anginals. So uh, keep the number of stents uh, lesser. But then since the patient was highly symptomatic, so there was no other option after some time. Juan, any, any comments? Well, I can only... Uh... Yeah, I can only support what Lucas says. I mean, uh, we can have the good devices in hands. That's not a problem. They are good companies, and Abluminus is for sure a good stance. But the problem is we're dealing here very, with very complex patients. So diabetic patients, a lot of calcium, long lesions. So we can do whatever we want. We know that the risk of having a stale failing in this situation is very high. So what we should aim at is try to reduce as much as possible the amount of metal in this artery. And I would personally, and that's what, the way I'm working in these cases, is making use of intraconary physiology. I mean, in this case, I mean, just understanding what is the real pattern of the disease, how is the extent of diffuse versus focal disease can help just try to to implant as short as possible the, uh, the, 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 the stent. I mean, we have good drug coating balloons, and I mean, distal beds are very useful for that. And going back to what happened to the, uh, the left main LAD bifurcation, I mean, 
physiology could have helped in this case in how far we should come back to the coronary ostium maybe I, I agree i mean if from the beginning we know that the disease extends to the ostium stand the left main if not i mean i would just make things simpler and try to avoid the ostium knowing that at one point this could be a, a mechanism of failure so i would definitely try to uh, to to avoid standing too far back to the ostium but mm -hmm. i find very useful in these cases um, using using physiology, whatever the method you use, but just to, to, to understand what kind of lesion we are treating. No, yeah, no, it's a really, really good point. And also the other point that I think uh, uh, Luca brought up is that we've got to go beyond the devices, right? And these are the patients whose, whose sugar have to be very, very well controlled, whose LDL should probably be absolutely less than 50, probably even less than 20. And, uh, and then LP little a should be checked because there'll be treatment for that. And, and smoking cessation, which is very, very highly prevalent in, in your country and, in, in, and even in ours. But I think these are the very, very important risk factor uh, evaluation. And Thank the, you so much. By Raj. the way, patient was highly symptomatic to start with. So after having done this, this is now uh, three, four months back. So patient has been very, very grateful. He came with a lot of fruit baskets and everything <laughs> that now I am absolutely symptom free. So I was not able to even do the routine activities prior. So thank you very much. All right, great. Well, thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, Raj. Okay. Oh, we, you had a question. Yeah, but he can answer from yeah, here yeah, while that's good. Juan gets ready Last question. for the, the Juan, come on up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So ju now just somebody from the audience would uh, like to know if you would consider a uh, culotte as a bailout for that LAD. And uh, if you decide not to touch, as you did, probably is the right thing not to stand too much. How would you follow this patient more aggressively in the next six months because of that residual osteo-LED? I, I think this is very important. I, even while handling it uh, in a stage two, I thought of all these points. So I studied that previous OCT done in the stage one and found out that uh, ostium of LED was fully covered and hardly there was any protrusion into the left main. Mm -hmm. So that made me think that why put another metal into the left main, making a culotte. Mm -hmm. So just a crossover from left main to circ, and there is no geographical miss at the LED ostium. And then let's do a very uh, aggressive uh, kissing balloon dilatation to the both. And that's where, and in fact, uh, I did OCT in the second stage to the LED also. And it was showing around, uh, you know, area of more than six at that point. So I was quite comfortable that let's leave it. And But yes, I think uh, I'm planning to do a angiography at the six months and then see what's happening. Perfect. perfect. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Juan uh, Iglesias now will tell us uh, a little bit about his case presentations, really uh, focusing on a shorter duration of DAPT. Thank you, Roxana, for the kind introduction. Thank you as well to uh, Concept Medical for the opportunity to discuss with you the late, latest iteration of the abluminous regulating stent, which is the abluminous NP without polymer. So I don't have the experience that these uh, gentlemen have with the abluminous DES, but we have come some kind of experience now with this new generation of uh, drug eluting stent. So these are my conflicts of interest. So why finally do we need innovative drug eluting stent designs? We heard a lot about nice cases with the abluminous DES, but I mean, the question is why do we need some new designs? So we have to remember that despite all these latest iterations, there's still persistent very late stent related outcomes after DES implantation. And these, these occur at a yearly event rate of 2% a year. And this is up to five years without any plateauing. So definitely there's a need for new, newer designs, drug eluting stent designs to uh, uh, improve this outcome. So why polymer-free drug eluting stand designs may be a potential, may have potential advantages. So the lack of polymer may reduce the chronic inflammation and improve vascular healing, therefore potentially improve clinical outcomes. But I have to say that unfortunately this has not been clearly demonstrated in randomized clinical trials. The absence of polymer may promote complete and faster re avoid persistent fibrin uh, deposition, and mainly allows for shorter dab duration and, and strategies. And this is of main importance in high bleeding risk patients, but as you can see, maybe in non-high bleeding patients uh, as well. So abluminous NP is the latest iteration of the abluminous DS plus stent. It has a unique uh, technology, and it's not just about having a polymer-free coating. It has, as mentioned already, like the abluminous DS plus an abluminal coating that facilitates monodirectional drug release, reduces systemic drug exposure, and leads to faster re -endotalization. 
It has as well a fusion coating, so as already discussed here, this, the coating on the stent and as well on the exposed surfaces of the balloon and proximal and distal hands of the balloon facilitate homogeneous drug delivery, combining the concept of having a drug looting stent and a drug coating balloon, and mainly addresses the entire, the entire area of disease, both focal and edge restenosis, and this is really important when dealing with patients with lung and diffuse disease. And as mentioned, this requires a 45 seconds inflation time at least. And finally, it has this nano carrier drug delivery, what we call the nano active technology, which facilitates the acute and sustained drug transfer into the vessel wall. So how does it work? Submicron particles of sirolimus are encapsulated in a highly biocompatible phospholipid carrier. And then this uh, is sprayed on the surface of the stent and therefore both stent and exposed parts of the balloon are coated with the sirolimus encapsulated. And this ensures 100% coating and a uniform distribution of the drug on the vessel wall. So this is how it looks like. So you have the stent here in the balloon and proximal and distal to the edges of the stent, as you can see, there's a 0.5 millimeter segment of the stent which is exposed, or sorry, of the balloon which is exposed to the uh, drug elution. And this is between the marker proximal and distal to the stent and the stent itself. So the coating is on the entire distance between the both markers. So the abluminous NP stand platform is a thin strut, 73 microns, cobalt chromium stand platform with a peak-to-peak -peak alignment. And very interestingly, and uh, this is of high importance when we treat bifurcation lesion, this has an hybrid cell design, meaning that open cells are present in the mid-segment and they are closed cells in both proximal and distal hands. And the design of the stand is made for the zero portioning design. So this is how it looks like, stand platforms. There are three stand platforms, 2.25 up to four millimeters, with you can see here different connectors. The maximum expansion limit is 5.5, and this is important for the 4.0 platform to treat large vessels such as left mains. You have a quite reasonable metal to water ratio between uh, 12 and uh, 14, 16 um, uh, percent. And the maximum expanded circular cell diameter is 6.7 millimeter square. And this is uh, highly important when treating a again, bifurcation lesions. So what about the in vitro drug release? We have here a non-polymeric stent. So as you can see, 50% of the drug is released within the first seven days during the burst phase. And then the total 80% of the drug is released within 38 days to ensure arterial healing and facilitate faster endothelialization. So what at the end could be the advantages of this newer generation uh, drug eluting stent with de specific design? The absence of a polymer can reduce inflammation and facilitate early vascular healing. There's reduced in-transit drug loss due to the encapsulation and the absence of polymer. There's an homogeneous expansion at drug distribution that facilitates penetration of the tissue uh, of the drug into the tissue and its bioavailability. Bio and there's an effective drug transfer to the deepest layer of the vessel war and this all together ensures early vascular healing. So let me show here two cases that we did and the subset of patients we are treating with this kind of device. This is a 76-year-old female with posterior ST elevation myocard infarction, and this lady was uh, a patient with high bleeding risk factors. And as you can see here, there's a, a total occlusion of the proximal circumflex. And you can see on the right side, very diffusely disease on the LED without any focal lesion. As you can appreciate here as well, discrete stenosis at the osteum of the, of the diagonal, sorry, and a very long segment of a disease in the proximal right cornea artery. So I think that this is a nice case uh, for uh, the kind of approaches that we tend to have in this high bleeding risk patient in order to reduce the amount of stent, is to combine this platform with a uh, drug cortic balloon in order to uh, reduce as far as we can the duration of the dual antiplatelet therapy. So the lesion was prepared with a 3.0 by 50 non applying balloon and a 3.515 proximally. And this is the angiogram following uh, the lesion preparation. And as you can appreciate here, a quite complex 1211 uh, Medina 111 uh, bifurcation lesion with the um, OM branch. So the distal bed was prepared with a non-compliant balloon, 2.5 by 20, 2.5 by 15 in the marginal branch. And sirolimus coated balloons were applied in both branches sequentially, 2.5 by 20 and uh, 2.5 by 20 as well in the marginal branch. And proximally, a 2.75 by 20 abluminous NP, which was sequentially uh, post dilated to uh, 3.0 uh, at 18 atmospheres. And this was the angiographic result at the end of the procedure with some distal embolization into the marginal branch, but a quite uh, uneventful course. 
The patient came back three months after, and this is the result of uh, the uh, left circumflex uh, stenting. As you can see, very nicely patent branches, bifurcation is spared. And we went on by treating the proximal right cornea artery with two 4.014 and 4.015 uh, abluminous NP after lesion preparation with cutting balloons mainly at the osseum, as this is our regular practice. And the stent was post dilated to 4.5 and 5.0 with non compliant balloons up to uh, 16 atmospheres. The patient was discharged on DAPT, aiming at only three months at maximum of dual antiplatelet therapy combining aspirin and a ticagrelor. This is a second case, different from the previous one because this is a young patient, 52-year-old male, active smoker, anterior STEMI, and uh, this patient did not meet uh, criteria for high bleeding risk. And as you can see here, there was a tight, superclusive, highly thrombotic lesion of the proximal LAD just before this uh, first uh, septal branch. So this is the circumflex as well, as you can see, no disease on it. And on the right cornea artery, short, as you can see, a quite tight, proximal, osteal right cornea artery stenosis. And this was after injection of nitrates, just to make sure that we were not dealing here with uh, a spasm uh, induced by the catheter. So we went on treating the patient with, uh, uh, with a stent on this proximal LAD. We tried to keep it as short as possible. So this is a 3O by 20 uh, abluminous NP after a lesion preparation uh, with a, a non-compliant balloon up to three. And, first, and the following that, the, patient, the, the stent sorry, was posalated 3.5 and 4.012 uh, uh, at 20 atmospheres. And this is the final result at the end, uh, leaving the uh, bifurcation completely uh, untouched. We land just proximally, pretty nice result, uneventful course, and the patient was discharged on DAPT with ticagrelor and came back two months later. I mean, this was the initial experience that we have with the stent, so that's why we brought these patients maybe a little bit uh, later than expected for considering the right cornea artery stenosis, but the patient was completely uneventful and went up treating the ostium of the right cornea artery with a 4.0 by 16. And you can see here uh, the final result of the post dilation up to 4.5 millimeters. So I think this patient uh, is a nice case because I mean, it, it shows how we can make use of this technology in patients with non-HBR uh, criteria in order as well to try to understand whether we could reduce the length of dual anti therapy. And you will uh, hear about this a little bit later here. So what kind of data do we have in, on this new platform? We have only two small studies. The first in man study performed in six centers in, in India, two cohorts, 58 patients with de novo coronary lesions and 28 patients with uh, an old commerce design. And you can see here very nice uh, results in terms of uh, device success and uh, very low event rates in this uh, very first uh, patients treated, first in man patients with 0% stent thrombosis rates. So really reassuring data in terms of safety. And these are, uh, this is the, the design of the post-marketing surveillance study. So this is a prospective non-randomized multicenter registry performed in India. The primary endpoint was MACE as a composite of cardiac death, target vessel MI, clean clinically indicated TLR uh, at 12 months, and stent thrombosis was assessed as a secondary endpoint. And these are the results at one year in a cohort of 90 patients showing very low event rates, as you can see here at one year with no case of stent thrombosis. And this data supporting the safety and efficacy of the device Though we have only a few patients included, but I think that's really important to notice here, we don't have any case of stent thrombosis at one year. I mean, created the rationale to extend a little bit further the, uh, the potential of the stent in these patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction in order to reduce the duration of the antiplatelet therapy. So this is the STARS-DAP trial that we are currently running in Europe. This is an investigator-initiated prospective multicenter randomized controlled pilot study. We aim at including 350 all-commerce patients with acute STEMI treated with albuminous NP at the, on the, um, at the, the, the culprit lesion and as well at, as, um, as a standard state, conventional stent in bystander disease. And these patients will be randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion 
in a P2I12 receptor uh, single antiplatelet therapy arm consisting of prazogrel and tacagrel or up to 12 months, and aspirin will be discontinued after primary PCI or at latest at the hospital discharge. And these patients will be compared to a conventional DAP group consisting of 6 to 12 month DAP uh, combining aspirin and a P2I12 uh, receptor inhibitor prazogrel or tacagrel or followed by aspirin, a single antiplatelet therapy. So two co-primary endpoints, and uh, th based on a non-inferiority hypothesis, we look at efficacy. MACE, as a def uh, defined as a composite of all-cause death, non-fatal myocardial reinfarction, stroke, target vessel revascularization, and stent thrombosis at 12 months, and a safety outcome uh, consisting in the BARC class 3 to 5 major bleeding at 12 months. So this study will create, hopefully, the rationale for this different or this new uh, anti strategies in these high ischemic risk patients. So my take home messages, PCI with newer generation drug looting stents is still associated with persistent very late stent related adverse outcomes. And this discloses from my perspective the need for modern and innovative DS designs in combination with, as they discussed previously, with new generation drug coding balloons. Ablominus NP Cyrolimus solution coronary system is a novel DES with a unique hybrid technology. It combines a polymer free Cyrolimus solution percent platform with a Cyrolimus coated balloon and it's specifically designed to promote early vascular healing and this in, uh, with the aim to allow a short adapt strategy. The safety and efficacy of a P2I12 inhibitor based SAP compared to conventional DAP after PCI with Ablominus NP in patients with STEM is currently investigated in the stars dab randomized controlled pilot study, and the results of this study may contribute providing rationale for the use of an aspirin-free antiplatelet strategy after PCI with modern DS, specifically designed to facilitate faster endotelialization. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Juan. Congratulations for designing a, a very first. I think uh, there is a, another study not particularly with this stent technology, but compare STEMI, which will also be randomizing patients after a STEMI into <clears throat> monotherapy with these potent agents, which I think is really the way to go. But then to test that in a, in a platform that has been designed for better healing, it really is, is fantastic. Uh, are there any questions from the, from the panelists before we go to, to my talk? Anyone from the audience? N nobody from the audience. Any, so. any comments? Yes, Azim? Yeah. I, have, I have two questions, maybe simple. It used to be just called a voluminous, nice a voluminous NP. Is the NP no polymer? Yeah. So it stands for? Okay. And then the other thing I hadn't realized, I guess, until your picture, so thank you, was the marker. There's a marker, then there's 0 0.5 millimeters, and then the stand starts. Right. So I guess it's important for people to think about that when they're trying to be accurate in side branches at the osteum or aorto osteal lesions, right? I mean, exactly. you really have to look at, there's a little gap between the mark and where the stand. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. That's exactly right. correct. Any questions from the audience? Good. All right. Well, thank you, Juan. Excellent. My, my pleasure now to introduce the, the oh. chairwoman, Dr. Roxana Miran. Well, She's been you. incredible running so many trials, but perhaps one of the most one in the diabetic arena yeah. is Abiluminus uh, with ability with Abiluminus. Rock. Well, thank you so much, Alex, and, and thank you for this wonderful uh, group of experts who have probably the most experience with this Abiluminus stent, but that, uh, and the courage of, of Concept Medical to move ahead with a head-to-head -head comparison with the best in class DES, which would be the Zion stent, and in the highest risk patient population, which would be diabetic patients, who are being referred for PCI. And I think it's really important to understand that this particular trial was designed by an incredible steering committee um, and uh, run and conducted with, uh, by Mount Sinai and CERC. Uh, together as a, as a team, Marie-Claude Maurice and her team at Cirque and my team over at Mount Sinai has done almost all of the work in terms of uh, evaluation of the patients. But most importantly is the, are, are our sites who have been fantastic and enrolled patients in a fast and speedy way because this really is an unmet need in our diabetic patient population in, in the most... Uh, incredible 
time of our lifetime, which is during the COVID pandemic, and they enrolled on uh, the patients in a swift way. And I think it has to do, and these are my important disclosures for everyone to note, everything, uh, specifically for research payments to my institution from multiple device and drug companies that I work with. But I think it brings us to talk about uh, diabetes and why is it important for us to focus not just in enhancing our devices, but also our medical management of these patients. Coming to the cath lab and getting devices or going to bypass surgery is not the end all for these patients. There has to be a complete change in their lifestyle and enhancing their medical management to the highest level if we are going to make an impact in reducing the burden of cardiovascular events in patients with diabetes. And it is a growing epidemic. Uh, the CDC will tell you that uh, as of today, like over 400 million patients are living with diabetes, half a billion, half a billion by 2035. And um, very, very important is about all of the things that we have to do. And I think the, the fact of the matter is that we really have a tremendous epidemic. One person in 11 has diabetes in the world. And I think this is quite, quite incredible. We also know that these patients are studded with ischemic events. Um, if you look at the, the Swedish National Diabetes Register, which is very well done, as you all know, the Swedes know everything about every person who lives in Sweden. And these are patients who they looked and matched them uh, with controls on the basis of sex, age, and county, and you can see that the causes of death and acute myocardial infarction being so much higher in patients with diabetes. We all know that diabetic patients have a different way of atherosclerosis. The disease is complex. The lesions are remodeled differently, and the vessel is remodeled differently. And of course, very importantly, they're diffusely diseased. This makes the current technology, whether it's distal lima or um, bypass surgery, which has now really been the, one, the, the, the treatment of choice in a lot of these patients with multivessel disease, still problematic because most of these patients don't have great distal targets because of the diffuse disease. So maybe bypass is better for them in, in those that were in the clinical trials who were handpicked to be in clinical trials. But the truth is that when you are in the lab and you see these angiograms and you bring in the, 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 the surgeons, often they will say, boy, where's the target? Where would I put this? And I think when they cannot do and mostly will not do total arterial revascularization, you are left with the choice of PCI. And I think it's really, really important to, to note that. And of course, a heart team approach is the way to go with diabetic patients. And management is, has to do with all of us coming together, looking at all aspects of these patients and working closely with our surgical colleagues. If they're going to only, and talking to them about total arterial revascularization in these patients and not vein grafts, because we do know that vein grafts fail also in these patients, maybe even worse than some of our devices. And if you look at the Barry trial with the 25 years uh, follow-up now, um, there is this better outcome in diabetic patients undergoing bypass compared to PCI, but this is PCI of the old age when we had first generation stents and not even drug eluding stents in some of these. And I think we have come a long way in improving stent technology and thanks to Concept Medical for taking it yet to another step. Um, when we did the Freedom Trial, uh, and I worked on this trial with Dr. Fuster as, as, as um, Alex Abazide also, who enrolled lots of patients in Brazil, we also showed that PCI did worse in terms of death of mind, stroke, as well as even maybe even all-cause mortality down to line out to five years. And again, this was with first-generation drug-eluting stents, not including the best-in-class um, stents. 
when you look at Everolimus saluting stents with cabbage and multivessel disease, we're seeing for all cause death to be similar in, in some of the matched registries and the New York State registries, but certainly, and we see in a little bit more stroke, but certainly more revascularizations. And very importantly is this myocardial infarction and the recurrent recurrence of um, uh, these patients coming back with more revascularizations and then, of course, procedure-related MIs that could also then get captured in these registries. And the completeness of revascularization being very, very important in these patients as a very, very uh, important reason why we're probably not doing the best when we bring these patients for PCI. So when you decide to do PCI, it is really important to use image guidance, to use IVIS FFR in the best possible way, to not to be using all stents in everywhere, perhaps using some of the drug-coated balloons, but using the best possible technologies uh, in enhancing this. But can we find and have we made some progress in stent technology in diabetic patients? And I think we heard a lot about Abluminus. This entire um, uh, symposium is dedicated to the toughest cases in, uh, with Abluminus DES. This is, um, we talked about the carrier and the, and the fact that there is Abluminal DES uh, where there is Abluminal surface of the drug uh, and then, of course, some coating uh, where you um, uh, receive the coating on the stent and the exposed uh, parts of the balloon just outside of the stent. So you're getting almost a homogeneous and a very, very well uh, deployed even in the areas um, uh, as you uh, deploy the stent between the struts where you're getting some drug elution and drug, co uh, drug delivery to the vessel, and it is in the abluminal surface. And so therefore, again, another thought about early healing and the issues. We've went, gone through this particular slide. Dr. Kumar showed it very, very well. This uniform coating, faster reundothelialization with the abluminal coating, and then, of course, uh, dealing with both focal and edge restenosis. And this idea that we could use this particular stent in a way with its thin struts dealing with some of the smaller vessel diffusely diseased uh, diabetic patient population. And I think it's very important to also, we heard the acute MI and, and uh, uh, Dr. Glacius is doing the very first with the end with the, the new stent design for uh, reduction and going to single antiplatelet therapies. So why ability DM? I think it just was a lowest hanging fruit when you have a stent as such as this with homogeneous drug delivery, even outside of the stent, giving the diabetic vessel the best possible chance for reducing restenosis and recurrent events. And I think this randomized clinical trial in diabetic patients who are eligible for PCI, referred for PCI, would be, uh, would be a perfect uh, way to conduct this prospective multi-center randomized trial with the one-to-one -one randomization where there is a blinded follow-up by the follow-up staff where we are looking at, tar at, at um, target lesion failure at one year, TLR at one year, powered for non-inferiority with sequential uh, superiority uh, testing with the TLF for also non-inferiority. We went to 20 countries, 100 sites all around the globe. And of course, um, the stent of, uh, of, of study is abluminous DES and uh, versus the Zions Everolimus saluting stent. We have an incredible uh, steering committee and uh, executive operations committee with Antonio Colombo, Alex Abazide, and, and um, Sansei Saito as our study PIs. Marie-Claude Maurice as the head of CERC, uh, myself chairing the executive, um, executive committee, and then the steering committee, which is a fantastic group of uh, Dr. Malik, Dr. Hildek Smith, Dr. Dudek, Dr. Testa. Uh, and uh, Dr. Tolg and Dr. Fowry. The study design I already, um, I already discussed to you, did 
uh, these patients would be eligible, the angiographic criteria meeting the, 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 the eligibility criteria of vessels and target vessels and lesions of, of uh, 2.25 to 40, and you could get up to two vessels uh, treated. The primary endpoint is ischemia-driven TLR at one year, um, which is powered for non-inferiority with sequential superiority testing, and then target lesion failure. We have two co-primary endpoints, which is a composite of cardiac death, target vessel MI, ischemia-driven TLR, and that's powered for non-inferiority. We're going to look at a bunch of uh, secondary endpoints. We have finalized enrollment. We are now at the tail end of following these patients for one year. We have a fantastic data safety monitoring board chaired by Professor Bott, as well as a independent clinical events committee chaired by Professor Marks. We intend to present these data for the very, very first time at ACC 2024, and we can't wait to do so. So um, the fact of the matter is that diabetic patients are increasing numerically. They have more complex, P, more complex CAD, high risk of cardiovascular comorbidities, despite optimal medical management. But let us all note that we are not doing the best job in the optimal medical management of these patients. Historical randomized clinical trials have shown that perhaps cabbage is superior to PCI, but never really testing in a large number. This will be the largest pa uh, diabetic uh, patient study, 3,000 patients, um, diabetic patients ever undergoing PCI. And I think this is very, very exciting and a very big testament to Concept Medical, who's the sponsor of this study, who's been with us, supported this study, supported the sites, and we are so looking forward to the results in ACC 2024, where I hope to see you all. We wanted to present it at TCT, but we're just at the very end of, uh, very end of the follow-ups, and we want to do... Um, the best possible job and hopefully have great news for you guys with a new option for our diabetic patients. Thank you so much for your attention. <clears throat> Before we close, we only have four minutes. We, any final comments from anyone or questions, please? Yes, well, Luca. If I, well, if I can, well, obviously, uh, I just want to congratulate with you and all the team because this is really a gigantic effort. And obviously, um, I'm pretty sure that this will be an endless source of information in a setting where we need more information. And this is actually just a comment on a question. But also, I know in which extent you are very careful in terms of medical therapy, glycemic control, and all the needed steps because we need to remember, all of us, that this is not coronary artery disease. This is just a manifestation of diabetes, diabetes in the heart. Disease, yeah. So this is a systemic disease. So we are looking at specific thing. Nevertheless, we need to remember these are, you know, th this complex situation has to be considered in all the aspects. This is one of the most important, of course, because it has to do with survival, with prognosis, and that's it. But definitely this will be an endless source of information. Thanks for all of the oh, effort that you, you put. Thank you all. With I that mean, we can close. Well, <laughs> at a time that um, there's so much excitement on other things and coronary intervention is becoming maybe not as exciting, I think we, are, we absolutely have our challenges and we absolutely have to look at the best possible technologies that could address some of this. That may include a combination and a hybrid approach with the best in class DES that is designed for these types of patients like Abluminous, but with some combination as well with some drug-coated balloons as we saw in that very first case. So there's a lot of work and I think we're really looking forward. I know Azim, you're gonna be leading the ISR and the de novo programs of, of the Magic Touch drug-coated balloons, but we're also very excited that at the end of the day, stents aren't really going away and we still have to make sure that we absolutely enhance and bring forward the best possible outcomes for our patients. Thank you all for staying as long as this. It is exactly 6 p.m. And I'll let you all go off and, and thank you for being here.